Hello, everybody. I'm Allison Cuddy, the Artistic Director of the Chicago Humanities Festival, and welcome to this program, What's Next? The Future of Museums. You can access captioning for this program and all of our digital events right here in YouTube, and you can find out more about our upcoming programs at chicagohumanities.org. I want to thank Rebecca McDade, who's a longtime friend and supporter of the festival and who is underwriting this entire What's Next series. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And now on to our event. Lisa Yun Lee is a cultural activist and she is the executive director of the National Public Housing Museum here in Chicago. She will lead the conversation with Chevy Humphrey, who's president and CEO of the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. She's the first woman and first black American to lead the museum. Also joining them is Elizabeth Merritt, founding director of the Center for the Future of Museums and vice president for strategic foresight at the American Alliance of Museums. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Lisa, Elizabeth, and Chevy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Yun Lee, and I'm so happy that you are all here with us today in this virtual world. Thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to the good people of the Chicago Humanities Festival. Today, I am talking to you from Chicago, the traditional homelands of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and Potawatomi people. Chicago is also the place where Jean-Baptiste de Sable established the first settlement with the help of his wife, Kitty Hawa, who was a Potawatomi woman whom he married in 1770. Following the settler violence culminating in the Black Hawk War of 1832 and the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, many indigenous people were forcibly removed from these territories or killed. Over a century later, under a different set of government policies called the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, many indigenous nations found themselves once again coerced to move, but this time back to the urban centers where their ancestors were originally dispossessed. Today, Chicago has the third largest urban native population in the United States with more than 65,000 Native Americans in the greater first black American and the first woman to lead the Museum of Science and Industry. Let's have some snaps for that. <laughs> and also Elizabeth Merritt, the fearless and fierce founding director of the Center for the Future of Museums. But more importantly, two wonderful women that I have the pleasure of calling friends. So how are you both doing? It's great. I'm doing great. How about you, Elizabeth? I'm doing good. I'm just enjoying the company of a few hundred thousand of my cicada friends here in Washington, D.C. Ooh, yes, that's right. <laughs> um, so I just want to kick it off with everyone getting to know you a little bit better. And can you tell a quick two minute story about how you got into the museum business? Javi, can we start with you? Oh, mine is so untraditional. Um, I was at a job uh, prior to this, and my goal was I really wanted to be a CEO of a nonprofit uh, organization. And um, in that job, someone told me that I didn't look the part for that job. And I said, hmm, I'll show you. <laughs> and I went to uh, interview at the Arizona Science Center, the museum that actually I had been for 22 years. And the CEO asked me when I interviewed, 
well, where do you see yourself in five years? And I said, well, your job, can you train me to do that? <laughs> and that's how I got in the museum business. And I fell in love with it. Uh, love it. Yeah. What about you, Liz? Well, I grew up a museum brat in Cleveland, Ohio. I always was bicycling down to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and volunteering after school. I ended up going to graduate school and working in a laboratory. I had originally intended to get my PhD, but I very quickly realized I didn't want to spend my life in a laboratory. So I left with a master's and I took a few months to think about what is the coolest job in the world I could possibly imagine. And I decided the answer was working in a museum. So how old fashioned is this? There used to be this huge printed directory called the official museum directory. Well, my husband and I had decided we wanted to move to Massachusetts. So I wrote a letter to every single museum in Massachusetts asking for a job and I got one. So, wow, the hustle. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Poughkeepsie with a working class family and we did not have air conditioning. And my parents took me to museums so that we could actually have respite and be cool, <laughs> like literally. Right. And they were also places where, you know, they thought I could learn to, you know, how to pass in sort of a white society, you know, and so there always were these sort of uh, contested spaces for me, but mostly it was like spaces of beauty and just a restfulness. Um, I want to get like real, real quick with you all. Um, Chevy, the Museum of Science and Industry uh, was opened in 1933 as part of the vision of Julius Rosenwald, the chairman of Sears, Roebuck and Company, but also a visionary committed to racial equity and justice. He was good friends with Jane Addams and also started the Rosenwald schools that focused on education for African-American people. So there's a kind of direct link from the MSU's founding to someone with vision of racial justice and equity. Um, and so I'm wondering this past year in response to the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and too many others, there were global uprisings and calls for justice, the defunding of the police. How did the MSI respond? How do you believe the work of museums was transformed by this moment? You know, um, I was not at MSI at the time, but um, speaking uh, to a lot of my colleagues, MSI held the internal dialogues about how to be better support for the Black community, both from our staff to our communities we serve. We were a, a trusted source and a safe place to have these conversations. MSI partnered with nonprofits to host volunteer food drives, use social media channels, to amplify the work of Black organizations and local Black businesses. Mm. Um, and, and, and I will just say, you know, in Arizona, when the George Floyd and all of these terrible, heinous events happened, I had to step back. It was personal to me. And what it did, it brought out the things that I sort of hid hid in the background trying to focus on you know my career and what I was doing but it brought up all of these 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 feelings and these things that had happened to me that I pushed back and said oh this you know this is I I you know I shouldn't I shouldn't focus on this I should focus on on staying forward but it brought up all of those racial inequities and the experiences that I went through as a six-year-old a 12 year old, a high schooler, a college, it brought up all those feelings that I had to take a moment to just really understand, you know, how, how, how do I handle this? And how do I bring my team and the community along um, through this? And um, it was a personal responsibility to generate, you know, interest in, in the importance of our Black community, but also how can I do this through the work that I'm doing? How do I create a STEM, STEM equity and programs for young people of color to welcome them into this inclusive environment? Um, and so the higher bar we're aspiring to and all of us are aspiring to is our rightful presence that people see our institution at MSI, that it exists for them, where they feel that they belong and that is designed and managed with them in mind, us yeah. in mind. Mm. 
Thanks. And I think this idea of the personal being political and also the inner work and the outward facing work um, that needs to happen is so important in your story. Um, Liz, I mean, you sort of saw there were a lot of statements that were issued. Do you think they were effective? You know, what have you witnessed as a kind of transformative um, sort of catalyst to museum field right now? I don't know if the state, I think the statements were a necessary and appropriate first step, even when they seemed woefully inadequate. Oh. And sometimes they did, but sometimes you have to do something inadequate because it's the right thing and then figure out where to go for there. I think the harder step has been figuring out how to make real progress past that. Uh, and both American museums and our colleagues in the UK are finding that the really hard bar to move is the composition of our own boards and staff. Uh, so in some ways, the policies, the statements are easier to push out and they're a good first step, but I think the real, the real measure will be how much we are able to, to change ourselves internally uh, in coming years. I have hope though, because I have pointed out as a futurist, if you look back a hundred years, two of the major events in the US were the, the great flu during World War I and another wave of race riots, some of which started in Chicago. And if you look over a hundred years, I would argue, even though our progress in civil rights and racial equity is woefully inadequate, it's been better than our progress in pandemic preparedness. So maybe the events of the, of the last year actually will spur us to make some improvements in a measurable way in the next hundred years. Yeah, and I definitely feel like um, this kind of history of museums being both spaces where power and privilege reassert themselves and also potential spaces for radical democracy sort of like came and abutted themselves to one another. And I agree with you. I think a lot of the statements were sort of toothless, but also really important um, sort of first steps for some institutions. And also for other institutions, it became something that staff and communities could hold up and hold the institution accountable to, right? Um, alongside this kind of sort of twin uh, viruses that people were talking about, right? I mean, I never want to romanticize the plague that we just went through and talk about silver linings, but Arundhati Roy has talked about this pandemic as a portal, a portal to um, hopefully a new world that we know is coming. She so beautifully has written, you know, another world is not only possible, she is on her way on a quiet day. I can hear her breathing. Um, what do you hope the museum field has learned from this moment um, around COVID-19? Liz, do you want to start? For sure. And I think the most important thing we can learn from this is noticing what we had to give up and what we gave up successfully that maybe wasn't serving us well to begin with. Uh, one of the big barriers for futurists is helping people understand how profoundly they have power to change the future and, and navigate change. But one of the biggest problems is impelling people to leave their area of comfort and actually venture into new processes. Well, I think a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, many museum people would have said that the most effective way to do programming was in person and that there was no real market that they had to be able to reach people who wouldn't come to the museum itself. And now museums are finding out that they were reaching people around the world and, and touching their lives in a meaningful way during the pandemic. In-person programming is great. It's not going to go away, but I think a lot of museums are going to make that change permanent. And similarly, I think a lot of museums are realizing that there's a profound role that they can play in helping the most vulnerable in their communities. And that's not at odds with their mission. It's a natural match for the way that they're set up to share their resources as nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about you, Chevy? You know, uh, uh, a, a, a CEO of, 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 of a medical, the largest medical, um, um, group in Arizona said to me, everything we do before a pandemic may seem alarmist. Everything we do, everything we do after a pandemic will be inadequate. Mm. And so that was a quote that he gave me at the beginning of the pandemic. And the, the, how, we, how we saw it as how can we help? It wasn't that 
we were trying to be self-preservation, trying to take care of our organization. We needed to adapt quickly. We needed to innovate. We needed to execute. We needed to understand what our community needed. We needed yeah. to be nimble and ready to adapt to approaches that would ensure the success of our community and the needs in our community. I mean, what COVID did was bring an equity in education. You had school children who were in homes with no internet. You had, you had, you know, hospitals without PPE. You had so many things that you had to provide in the community. And so MSI responded by having 4,000 free science activity kits to give to families and through libraries and parks and community organizations. 8,000 pieces were created of PPE made on our 3D printers for medical workers. We, were, we leaned in. But what that silver lining taught us was that we need to consistently lean in, not just because there was a pandemic. This should be a way of, way of how we do our work. So it really transformed and helped us to really get down to basics and help us to open our eyes to what we need to be grateful for and what our responsibility really is. Yeah, no, I love that. And that kind of necessity for us to be responsive to the needs of the community um, and how we can ingeniously do that. Uh, I thought, you know, we at, at National Public Housing Museum, we employed several artists to be making masks, but also distributing them and, and educating people about the history of mask usage. And I, I had not known that about the 3D printers, and that's such a beautiful story. And I think also this um, sort of nimbleness that you're talking about, a kind of gorilla quality that we need to also really hold on to. Um, I also think, you know, this moment, uh, the National Public Housing Museum decided to, for example, focus on everybody taking Spanish classes so that we could build our own capacities. I saw museums decide to actually invest in bilingual um, vinyl and signage on their walls because you know they were closed. And so I think there were a lot of ingenious ways that museums across the country responded to this particular moment, building their capacity and also responding to the needs of their communities. Um, I have to ask you, because I remember reviewing sort of grants during this period as part of like a Pew panel. And, you know, there were so many science museums that had like, please touch exhibits. And I was thinking like, what is the future of interactive exhibits, you know, after COVID-19? How has MSI been thinking about this? I'm very curious. You know, we leaned in and, you know, we added more people to the experience where there was more of a relationship where they were having more conversations where you didn't have to touch things to make things happen. You could just ask a question and have a dialogue about it, or you could do demonstrations and actually show our audiences, you know, the science behind this and, and have those open dialogues having guided experiences where we take you through the science museum and give you those experiences. Um, and they're different every time someone different tells you that story. And we also do online, you know, um, tours as well. Um, so we tried to mix it up a bit and make sure that we were engaging um, and meeting people where they were. Yeah. And I mean, I think the other really important thing that I want us to talk about is sort of the staffing issues that were revealed um, during this moment. Um, the so many educators, so many of the lowest paid, but the key people of museums were let go during this time. Um, at the same moment, um, new museum like Guggenheim, Museum of Tolerance of Los Angeles, the Fry Art Museum, they all formed unions also in recent years. Um, there have been lots of grassroots movement like Museum Workers Speak. More locally, there was MCA Accountable that raised really serious issues about pay transparency, about equity, um, and how the reality of working at an institution is often incongruous with the status of institution's reputation, right? With leaders making mid or high six-figure salaries and other people making 30 or 40 or 50. Um, 
how do you think, you know, museums can and should be responding to the awareness that labor issues, um, you know, that have been brought up during this moment? You know, what is the future of this and how are you grappling with this? Chevy, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about MSI or your, also you can talk about, I mean, you have so much experience, not just MSI, but also as just somebody who's leading in the museum field. You know, this is a, a topic that comes up quite a bit, even pre-COVID. And um, I will just tell you, um, I started my career out as a cashier and I was a very proud cashier. And I understood the importance of, of, of making a, a livable wage as a single parent. Um, and it's tough. And if I had not had mentors and people that were working with me and bringing me up along and helping me to understand how I needed to um, gain professional development, uh, move in that move in a direction where I could get promoted to different positions, um, I wouldn't be where I am right now. I believe in mentoring. I believe that every organization should mentor. I think our philosophy for continuous improvement, we need to constantly reassess staff roles. We need to really look at those public facing positions and evaluate those salaries and evaluate the work that they do, how we can acknowledge and recognize their work appropriately. We need to provide skill building. We need to provide opportunities for advancement. We need to provide accessibility. Accessibility is huge to managers and leaders so that we can bring the organization along and we bring the people along um, um, first. So there's a lot more I could talk about. I could talk to you about this probably for another hour, but it's important that we show our appreciation and we listen but we listen to hear. Yeah. What about you, Liz? What have you witnessed? Uh, and also, how are you thinking about this issue in, as a kind of futurist and the future of museums? Well, I love what you said, Chevy, about mentoring people and finding opportunities for advancement, because one of the lovely experiments I saw going on in a number of museums during the pandemic, some museums that had the luxury of having a stable budget and they just, they had to close, so they had the opportunity to say, we can keep people on staff, but if they're normally visitors facing people, what are they gonna do? So for example, one museum, I think it was the Blanton Museum of Art, had trained some of their security staff to start doing annotation of their digital images. Yeah. They had somebody yeah, else doing, doing donor acknowledgements. And I, this, is, this comes under my heading of revisiting assumptions we had that did not serve us well. In this case, who, me, who has what appropriate um, credentials to do what? Maybe we've over-professionalized and we're slotting people, well, you can only be a security guard and only these people who have a master's degree can go and do this, that, and the other thing. Maybe one of the things we ought to be thinking about is having pathways for advancement from any position in the museum and thinking about how training and mentoring helps people have an opportunity um, to move up. The other thing is, and I just want to correct the record here a little bit. You know, one of the things the press in the U.S. tends to do is only the cover the, the few dozen biggest museums. And it's valid to do that because their operations are important and they do set an example. But, you know, I, I've looked at the national salary data for museums and, and the vast majority of museums in the U.S. are, are small and medium sized museums. They're not huge. And the average disparity between the, the median salary for the lowest paid positions in the, U, in the museum, you know, not, not counting contract workers, but you know, the, the assistant educator and the director is only like a factor of three, it's not huge. So that, that's the typical museum in the US. That said, it's valid to look at the examples of the big guys to see how they're, what they're doing and, and, and how they're proceeding. I think that one other operation that's been questioned in the pandemic is where people have to live to do their work. And one of the things we're seeing if you poll corporate America is more people saying, oh wow, people actually will do real good work remotely. They don't have to be on site. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the big issues for the nonprofit field has been paying a living wage in cities that have really high living expenses. Maybe in the future, one of the things museum can do is have some people who are doing kinds of work that don't require them to be on site and pay a good living wage for where that put person is living, even if it's out 
in a state with a low cost of living um, and still have the opportunity to contribute to the museum's work. Yeah, that's interesting. I also think another way of looking at it, perhaps, is that it's imperative for the museum to prioritize affordable housing in the communities that they are operating in, right? Like we sort of see that we can't just operate in a silo in that way and sort of having affordable housing in Chicago, for example, becomes imperative if we're thinking about the salaries that we have to pay for worker museum workers in, in Chicago, right? Um, I also think, and I love that point that you brought up, Liz, that sometimes the press likes to exaggerate, right, sort of salaries. And we, but I do feel like salary transparency is a really big issue that we should all be pushing for right now. And also, Chevy, what you were saying, how can we disrupt kind of traditional, you know, vertical hierarchies? Like mentoring is one way that has always been so important for people, especially women and people of color. And also this, you know, the credential, the over-credentialing, I think that you mentioned, Liz, is so important. Like, do curators always have to have a PhD, right? Like, I mean, when, and also so many artists and other people have shown us that sometimes the security guards are actually the people who know the most about the work of art, right? Like being in the galleries and how do we engage people as visitor service um, people, as educators and sort of maybe cross train and stop thinking about slotting people into just one particular um, job. We have a cultural workforce training program at the National Public Housing Museum. And also we have kind of the luxury of reimagining what a job at the museum actually looks like. And I really do think this has to be the future of museums if we want to create a more equitable and a diverse, you know, workforce. I mean, that's just absolutely imperative. Um, hmm. Absolutely. Museums are so good at education. Why not hire bright young people who want to work in the museum and then give them the education and specialized training they need to the extent that there are special skills they need to to slot into particular career tracks. Yeah. You know, Lisa, one of the things that we did um, and something that I plan on bringing to MSI, but one of the things we did in Arizona was there were so many opportunities for people for professional development. We provided scholarships. We provided, I mean, our professional development uh, budget was so robust that we sent folks to conference. We had individual programs for personal development. Um, that was really key because it showed that our institution was investing in them. And that piece was, was, was so well received by our team. Yeah. I love this idea that, you know, one of the premier things that museums do is to educate the public. Mm -hmm. And how do we imagine the staff as a really important public and, you know, stakeholder to our work and investing in professional development and education, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, and taking it seriously that we are informal sites of education for all of us, right? Yeah, I love that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about accessibility. Um, I know the MSI has really capacious accessibility accommodations. Um, a student of mine did a study of your guide for people with sensitivities to light and sound. And I just found that so interesting that the museum is completely mapped out and helps people understand how to navigate those spaces um, if you have those sensibilities. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about the future of accessibility? Um, I think museums have really been designed and imagined for able-bodied people and like how do we actually change this you know I'm curious how you're thinking about it I think we need to ask we need to bring people in that we need to bring folks with disabilities into our museums and have them walk us through their experience yeah um, that is really critical and we I, I've done that in the past where I've had folks from the blind community, from the hearing impaired community come through and let us walk through their experience. And they tell us as they walk through what works and what doesn't work. Creating that rightful present that they see that this institution exists for them, where they feel belong, where we are providing the, the services that they need to have that equal experience of everyone else. And we need to keep that uh, 
top of mind in how we design and manage our institution, creating that inclusive environment. We also need to look at, you know, um, bilingual, as you said before, I mean, in what you did, Lisa, in your organization, creating Spanish language labs for school groups and dual education, edu educational materials. Those are the things that we're trying to do. Having special low sensory events that are less crowded and creating a more sensory friendly environment. So we're looking at all of those ways that we can make our place your place. Yeah. What about you, Liz? What have you seen out there? Who are some models that you feel like are, you know, sort of that we can hold up for doing amazing accessibility work? Oh, wow. So many. I mean, the museums, as Humphrey referenced, who are um, doing sensory friendly days and times, um, museums that are really pioneering ways of interacting with collections and exhibits for people who have visual impairments. But the other thing is I want to flip the question, actually, because talking about it this way really is sort of contrasting normative design with accessible design that is, you know, helping some people who need this. Yes, to yes, the difference right. between bad design and good design. Yes, yeah, you're right. Bad, bad design in the, in the, probably in the whole world, but definitely in the U.S. is like you, you create this fictional or typical, typical air quotes person who's usually white male and healthy and say we're designing, it's good design because it works for that person, you know, never mind everybody else. Mm -hmm. So I think accessible museum design is really like accessible design in the rest of our world. We had activists that had to, you know, throw themselves in the street and drag themselves up the steps to, to change the laws to, so that there would be curb cuts so people with, in wheelchairs could actually get around the city. And guess what? Now that turns out to be phenomenally useful for everyone, for moms and dads pushing strollers for you know, kids on bicycles, for people dragging suitcases. It's, it's not that that was accessible design. It was good design. Somebody yeah. has a brilliant idea. And I think a lot of the ways that museums are becoming more open to a variety of people with their mobility and their sensory approaches is just good design that realizes that not everybody is, has only one mo mo modality. But Elizabeth, yeah. I will tell you that it's, it's Design, sometimes designers don't always have the solution. You have to listen to your community. And I will tell you that when in Arizona, we were trying to figure out why we would not be attracting a diverse audience. And we brought in folks from the community and we said, why don't you feel welcome in this building? And they said, you are very sterile. You have no color. You don't feel <laughs> like you, we don't know where your front door is. And they gave us all of these things. Then we started, I said, they said, well, you need to paint your building. So I went to the team and I go, well, we need to paint inside our building so that we can, you know, have a more welcoming experience. And someone said, well, we can't paint because, you know, you know, we were told that we can't paint this building. I said, well, I'm the new CEO and I'm going to break the rules. We threw paint everywhere. And so when you walked in, you felt like you saw oranges, you saw purple. People felt like Fest was their place and that we listened. Then they started bringing in more people in their, in, in, in their communities. And you should see the eclectic group and the, the diverse melting pot that we had in Arizona because we listened to hear and we acted on that. Absolutely. It's so important to realize that not everybody sees things the same way. I mean, 10 years ago, when we commissioned a report on demographic transformation and the future of museums in the U.S., we had a, a research firm go and do some listening sessions. And one of the um, things that surprised one of the museums was some of the people from the Latino community were saying, well, one of the reasons we don't go into your museum is we don't feel safe. And the museum said, how can you not feel safe? We, we hire security guards to stand outside the front door. And the people said, that's why we don't feel safe coming in. It's like two completely ways of looking at the visual cues. No, I think that's so important. And this idea that the disability rights movement has taught us, right? Nothing about us without us and sort of realizing that who are the true experts for what people need. And I do think, and I really thank you, Liz, for 
sort of um, reminding me and chastening me to that the sense that it really is a question about good design, right? And right now, the vast majorities of museums, I think, are just badly designed. And we need a moment where we need to rethink how exhibits are made, you know, what, the, what is sort of the experience, and that it's not just the designers that have the answer. So I, I think that's really so important. Um, let's talk about like another really hot button item. I remember being at a board meeting once and talking a lot about equity issues and things that we wanted to do, including, you know, sort of staff training and board training. And then somebody sort of said, hey, listen, the 2018 UN sort of special report on global warming sort of said that by 2030, we're basically completely screwed. Like the climate, you know, sort of is going, it's irreversible, the damage that we've done. And so that means that we have now just under a decade to actually have our emissions and to, in order to avert the worst climate impacts that would be so destructive to the vast majority of the world. Um, how should we be thinking about climate justice and the role of museums in contributing to educating, transforming, advocating, whatever that needs to be done, like this of this looming crisis? I mean, let's start with Chevy as the science person, and also, you know, what is the role of the MSI, you know, in this moment? Yeah, the role is telling the story and advocating. I mean, science museums is there in particular have that responsibility and that role to play in educating the public about these critical issues. Right now, we are underway with a project that's looking at climate change with a focus on innovation, equity, and creating a sustainable future. Um, because our goal, you know, we want to inspire people to think about, you know, if we don't protect the earth, it will not protect us and how we act, how we behave, how do we create a sense of urgency, agency, and responsibility, that is really critical. Um, we already have exhibits on, on, on the floor on extreme ice with dramatic photos of the world's glaciers just melting, and people just stand there and they're just in awe saying, wow, this is happening real time around the world. We also have an Earth Reveal where it gives you real-time data from NOAA and NASA showing climate data and weather patterns. But the other piece that, that we're, we're talking about is the equity, the inequity of yeah. climate change. And we're telling personal stories um, of, you know, of situations so that people can understand that all things are equal. And we've learned that with the Michigan issue. Um, I have a personal um, uh, experience. You know, my mother had to teach because that was the only place she could teach was in Port Arthur, Texas, which is next to refineries. And it was a predominantly black community. And 85% of the people who lived in that community had lung disorders because that's where they had to live. There's a real equity issue here with climate change. Yeah. Liz, what about you? What have you seen? Well, I think I see museums doing fabulous work on three fronts. First, making commitments to improve their own impact, reduce their own impact. So you have museums like the Spurlock uh, committing to go carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. So that's great. The second thing I see museums doing is really impelling the public to take action. So for example, the, um, the uh, Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Garden in Pittsburgh has a great program with a local energy company where they talk to their visitors about the importance of this. And then they say, you can sign up right now during your visit to switch your energy program over to green energy. So that's huh. awesome. But as you said, Lisa, the problem is we're pretty far down this road. I think the other thing museums need to be doing is model how we respond to the terrible changes that are coming. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Louisiana Children's Museum in New Orleans has just designed an entirely new campus that says, you know what, it's going to flood. This is New Orleans. It's going to flood. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to build a campus that helps absorb and mitigate some of that flooding and also lifts the museum up because this is an example of what the city's going to have to do if it stays there. Wow. I also think, and I'm still waiting to see this, I think museums as leaders in their community and as trusted sources of information could be helping communities around the country decide how they're going to respond as a community to climate change. Some communities, especially coastal communities, are going to have to literally move. Mm -hmm. Some communities that are facing unlivable levels of heat are going to have to decide mm -hmm. whether they go underground or become smaller. There are real profound changes we're going to have to make. And some of it, to your point, Chevy, is accommodating climate refugees, people who are being displaced from where they live, usually pe poorer people or indigenous people or people of color. Uh, and in some cases, being displaced from formerly undesirable pieces of land because the wealthy people who had the beachfront property now realize that the new beachfront property is going to be 200 yards up the hill. So they're going to go buy out the, the older uh, communities that used to be affordable and displace them somewhere else. So I think we as a sector can be helping communities talk about these issues and say, what do we want to look like in 50 years? And how are we going to redesign our spaces? Or how are we actually going to relocate in a way that's equitable and sustainable? Yeah, no, I, I think the thing that things that you've said are all so good. And um, I remember reading the statistic that was, you know, people trust museums more than they trust their grandmother, right? And that we have to take that trust mm -hmm. so, um, you know, like it's so important and we have to get out of this nonsense of the kind of partisan debates around this um, and really embrace the science and embrace what we know and really commit to being those spaces that will not only teach and educate, but also, as you said, Liz, you know, help um, communities come up with solutions and model those solutions. Mm -hmm. I also think earlier when we were talking about how do we link the issues, right? Like we were linking the sort of safety and sort of accessibility issues. Like there's a lot of amazing scholarship out there now around climate change, around disabilities work, around sort of ecological and also cultural diversity and how they're linked, right? There's groups and movements like Wax and Greens here in Chicago who are thinking about, you know, linking racial justice with environmental justice. And like our work should be to be pulling people out of silos and sort of instead, I wish I had sort of, a reproach that person at the board meeting to, to sort of say that when we're talking about racial equity, we are talking about the environmental and climate justice crisis also, right? Like, and we're talking about policing, we're talking about all of these things. And I think it's important for us not to um, fall into that trap of thinking about like climate change is like the one thing which is different than other things and a better above, but it is, you know, a critical social issue that is here and we need to address this along with everything else that we're doing. Hmm. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a question. Like, you know, when we started today's event, you know, I started with a land acknowledgement that's sort of been part of, you know, our normal practices now as a kind of, both a practice of uh, the sort of recognition of the indigenous people, um, but also part of a larger, you know, hashtag decolonize museums movement. I just wanna have a shout out to Patricia Mariquin Norby, who's the Met's first curator of Na Native American art. We're so happy about that. Um, and a lot of museums have been moving to include more indigenous artists in our collections and also returning and repatriating remains and artifacts. Um, there's this really beautiful essay by Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang that's, that's called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. And they are really arguing that the only real result of decolonization is repatriation of indigenous life and land. And this means that it can't just be like, oh, we're improving our collections a little bit, or we're going to actually have more pay equity and we're calling this decal. Um, I was recently appointed to the Illinois State Museum Board by the governor. And part of our strategic plan is not to just only comply with NAGPRA, but like, how do we actually really become a model for 
both repatriation, but also respecting indigenous sovereignty. Um, this is a really hard issue. It's something that I think is the future of also a lot of justice movements. Um, how are you all thinking about decolonized museum movement, um, the sort of land that your museum sits on, and also how are museums, you think, um, Liz, grappling with um, the decol movement? Well, I think there are, there are a couple of different levels. And at, at the basic level, I think one of the huge roles museums have to play that they're, that they're upping their game on is just giving us a common understanding of history to have a, as a basis for a discussion. And that hasn't necessarily existed before. I, I know that when I went to school, the history I was taught of the US was, shall we say, extremely incomplete. So one thing that museums can do to set the stage for a conversation like this is at least have people understand the facts of who's taken power in the US and where the resources that we built the country came from, came from and how they were taken. Uh, so we can talk about how to how to move forward. But the other great thing about museums is, yes, they historically have accreted wealth and power, often from people who took that wealth and power um, in unfair ways. But now that they have it, they have a lot of leeway often about how they redistribute it. And some museums are doing awesome things. So for example, I, of course, the Abbey Museum in Maine, basically said, well, we're a museum the, the, that is talking about indigenous collections. Maybe our, our history was from how that was collected and interpreted from the white founders, but why don't we turn over the, the leadership and governance of the museum to the tribe? So it has its first indigenous director. So you can share power in ways that yes. make the museum more powerful. Yeah, I agree with that. Um... Chevy, what about you? How are you thinking about this? You know, similar to what Elizabeth uh, just stated, but I'll just add that we have, um, we, to acknowledge the land that we're on. We have a draft statement acknowledging Native American tribal lands, and it's very important, but it's got to be that inclusivity of asking and, 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 and getting the communities involved and helping having them help us learn uh, things that we should be doing. Um, and I just really think that bringing people together and, and acknowledging and listening will, will move us to that next, to, to, to a, a, a better way. And um, I don't want to repeat what Elizabeth said, but we're doing some of the same things. Yeah, I think that's so important and really, um inviting indigenous leaders mm -hmm. to be in conversation the same way that we talked about nothing you know about us without us with um trying mm -hmm. to think about the future of disabilities and access in our in museums like i think every museum that is on indigenous land in the united states should invite tribal leaders to discuss mm -hmm what would be a form of redress that made sense, right? I mean, that's the reality, which is the understanding of land and what it means to inhabit it is really a different whole, a kind of an ontology with indigenous people. So if there's not a world in which would be like, well, you need to take the museum off this land and we own it, right? Like it would be about shared governance. It would be about recognizing history and we could unleash our radical imaginations. And if we would just take that step and sort of have that kind of fierce commitment to creating a world where we really acknowledge the past wrongs and see museums as the sort of foundation for a more just democracy, I feel like this would be a really important issue for museums, not just the repatriation of objects, which is so important too, but I think all every single museum needs to be a part of this movement as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we actually have a bunch of questions coming in. So, and some of them are about past questions that we've asked. Um, and I wanna just bring some of them into our conversation. Um, I know that I have always been a little bit uh, skeptical of just like free Tuesdays or free Fridays um, because yes, like having the museum be free and accessible is so important, but also this kind of 
ability to help decide what is the art that people are seeing on the walls? Like, are there stories being told, not just being invited to come in, right? It's also just as important. But somebody is asking, like, you know, does the MSI actually have like free days? Like the MCA has Tuesdays, Art Institute has um, free entry for SNAP families. Like what it's sort of, it actually is a little bit pricey, I think, to go to the MSI. People are asking like, how are you thinking about the, what it costs to enter the museum? Um, we do have free days and um, we are thinking and looking at how do we increase those number of free days. And that's a conversation we're having. Um, so yes, uh, those free days do exist, but activities, making sure we have more activities. But one of the things we are looking at is doing more um, activities in communities where we're going out in communities and taking science and activating the communities with science. And so we're looking at doing a, a number of things, but uh, been here for five months and that's something that is actually a priority on my radar. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Um, are there things that you've seen in the field, Liz, around sort of pay and a, like sort of the cost of admission that you feel like are, is like interesting for people to know about? Wow, yeah, the most interesting thing is there's no clear correlation mm -hmm. between going free and automatically increasing the diversity of your visitorship. So if, if, it was really, if it were really obvious that that worked, the data would be there. Mm -hmm. Instead, we have museums that go from free to paid and museums that go from paid to free. And it's a very nuanced situation about whether it makes a difference. Some museums, when they go free, what they find is they just have the same people coming back more often, which is great, but it's not diversifying your audience. There are some other studies that have been done that have shown that the biggest barrier to some people attending museums isn't necessarily the cost. It's that they don't think the museum is relevant or important to them. That's a different barrier. So absolutely respect that people want to make uh, museums economically accessible, but there are other issues at play. Pay. It has to be something where people also feel it's something that they want to go make part of their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think this idea of accessibility is mm -hmm. both about sort of economics and also relevance to people's lives, right? And that's so, so important. That's something that I think we forget when we are soliciting corporations to give donations for a free day or whatever it may be. Um, um, there's another question here about how museums can become relevant or more relevant in a world where there's so much information online now, right? Like, wow. how do you actually think about what the work of museums can and should be, given the fact that, you know, you could just go to Wikipedia, you could look up anything like these days. So why go to a museum? Well, how do you know what's online is correct? How do you know if it's right? <laughs> And so we have people that are actually living and breathing and studying this all the time that we could provide context and help to facilitate that journey online uh, and, and to know what those trusted sources are and to tell the story and make sure that people understand it and can embrace it. And Liz, you were going straight there, so I'm gonna turn it over to you. <laughs> oh, you took care of it, Chevy. Thank you very much, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, guess, I guess if I want to, uh, if I were going to add something to that, I'd say, and the fact is, human beings are embodied place based beings. Mm -hmm. All of the evidence is at least so far virtual just doesn't live up to actually being able to see and smell and sometimes touch the real thing for yourself. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I mean, we really are, are sentient human beings. And this Commitment to the truth, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. But I also believe that the truth, like I think so much always about the South African definition of truth in the Truth and Reconciliation 
um, committee and how there's like forensic truth, which is just the facts, but then there's also sort of narrative truth that it's the truth that keeps you going and living. And then there's dialogic truth, which is the, when two different truths come into contact with each other, how do we make sense of it? And then restorative truth, right? And this kind of idea that museums are not just the places for forensic truth, but we can actually help make all of those forms of truth come into being, right? Like people can be in invited to tell their own stories. We can bring people into civic dialogue and also like what is the work that we need and can do to restore justice in the world, right? And so I think that's so important. And also, I guess I would just say that uh, even though the 21st century um, sort of is the time of visitor engagement, and we've talked about how that canonical museum essay by Elaine Hoyman Gurian, who I just adore and love museums at soup kitchen, you know, sort of said that we are not just keepers of beautiful objects and interpreters of objects, but we are spaces of engagement and need to be relevant to people's lives. And it launched like all the a whole movement that saying that objects are not key and important. I also just happen to love, love objects, you know, and I think coming into contact with an object and the aura of an object is just really magical. Chevy, can you share like now you've been there for five months, what is like the weirdest object or the most special object that you've encountered in the MSI? Um, I would have to say the, um, the, the weirdest object that I've come into to, to come into is a dog treadmill from 1872. It's a wood piece of farm machinery powdered by a dog or other <laughs> animals walking on a treadmill to churn butter or run a small mill. There's a lot more, but that really resonated with me because I'm like, how would my dogs do this? Cause I have two dogs. I was trying to figure that out. And so I'm like, can I bring my dogs to try this? And they're like, no, but that's, <laughs> that was the weirdest thing that uh, the most, um, you know, intriguing thing that I've seen thus far, but no, you, I am going to go through every part of our collections to really understand, you know, why we are stewards of these wonderful objects. Yeah, no. And I also, I love your story of that particular object because in some ways, like people always think about these rare and exceptional objects, but that's also kind of a strange like vernacular object that just somebody used, right? And um, the National Public Housing Museum also is very committed to deploying vernacular objects, objects of everyday use, just really tell the extraordinary stories that, you know, touch us. And um, I've seen like a, a little Pyrex dish that belonged to someone's grandmother or a garden hose that is in our collection, which tells the story of how public housing residents cared for their gardens and how important these spaces were like those are really the special objects that do the work that most need to be done um there's a couple other comments that i just want to shout out into this space somebody wrote that you know hey don't forget all docents should be paid not volunteer <laughs> right and like i think recognizing cultural labor is so important. And so I just want to like agree with that comment. Um, there's someone else who sort of said, maybe we should get rid of executive director positions or um, like that sort of division of labor, which so uh, imposes a kind of hierarchy. So just sort of want to throw that out there. I mean, I personally think that's like a very interesting idea to remove those hierarchies and think about a more horizontal leadership model. I don't know if you all would like think about that a little bit. Um, and then there's one other question I just want to put out there and you all can choose which one you want to respond to is about how do we actually make museums more culturally accessible and relevant to more people. So I'm going to throw those into the things you both of you just choose anything that you want to respond to. Um, I'll just start with the, how do we make um, museums more culturally relevant and I, I, I really think it's in the people that you hire. I think that museum has to, re the museum team and staff have to reflect the community and if we don't make it a point to ensure that we have 
uh, a diverse team, how can we serve our diverse community? Uh, that's really important. Every, um, every month I get an MSI data point since I've been there. And prior to me, even in Arizona, every month I would get, how do we look? What, is, what do we look like? Or do we reflect the community? Um, and that's really important uh, because when you have people that live in, the, in, in, in various com different communities, you're going to have that different perspective and thought as you develop your programs and what you do in the community. Yeah. Liz? Not that I can fit into one minute, so I'll pass. Okay. All right. Great. We have one minute left. Um, I just want to like share with people, if people are interested in uh, learning more about the National Public Housing Museum, they can go to nphm.org. We actually have our annual benefit tomorrow with e-viewing, the amazing Dr. Timuel Black. Um, and so please join us for that. Chevy, is there anything people should be coming to at the MSI? Yes, you have to come see Marvel, um, the power, the, the superpower exhibit. And we have an incredible story of the Black Panther. Um, we are just thrilled. So please come and see that. And um, we also have our Black creativity. You've got to come see our artists and our juried art. You've got to come see that. So those are things that uh, I hope that you can stop by and, and see. And, and when you come, ask for me. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much on site every day. And I just want to meet so many people in this community. This is just an incredible, welcoming community. So thank you so much for uh, your open arms. Yeah. Welcome, Chevy, to Chicago. We adore you. We're so happy you're here. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you, everyone in the audience for joining us tonight. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.